Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Alarm Task Force. If you're watching the video, if you're listening to the audio, you already heard our intro and a couple of our messages. But we are pleased today to be here. And our guest today is Peter Matthews. May ring a bell if you're in the fire service. Maybe ring a bell if you're in the fire service. He is the editor-in-chief of Firehouse Magazine, one of our leading trades for the business. He is also... Uh, has been the director of Firehouse Expo and will be the director of Firehouse Fusion. Did I get that right? Fire Fusion. Yep. We're, Fire we're Fusion. dropping the house, but we're adding the okay. fusion. Yeah. Fire yeah. Fusion, which will be coming up in November of 2024. That's correct. Yes. And we've changed locations. I heard we're going to be in Charleston or Columbia. Correct. Yep. We'll be, we'll be moving the event to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Correct. Yeah, that's a little closer to me. I might actually be able to make that if I'm, and it's not awesome. on the Jewish holiday. Thank no, it's not. Peter. You did we, it. we listened. We listened. Thank you. No, it's <laughs> great. It really is. All right. So we are so happy to have you back. And let me tell you folks a little sure. bit about Peter is the conference director and editor-in-chief of Firehouse Magazine. He has worked at Firehouse since 1999, just a couple of years, yeah. uh, serving in various roles on both Firehouse Magazine and the Firehouse.com staff. Staffs. He completed an internship with the Rochester, New York Fire Department and served with fire departments in Glenwood Landing and Rush, New York, and Laurel, Maryland. However, Peter, I must add, is a glutton like I am to for ride-alongs. And when he can, he's traveling on business or pleasure, he'll find a fire house and say, hi, can I go for a ride? And you, you got to read some of, some of the great comments he puts in about whether it's online or in the magazine about these visits, because like me, he's both a learner and a teacher, and he learns a lot with each ride along, and he shares it with us through the magazine. And with that, first of all, so happy to have you back, Peter. Thanks for taking time for just the little schedule that you have. I know you have lots of free time and can do other things. <laughs> No, I appreciate it, Steve. It's good to be back. It's good to see you. And again, you know, hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you next fall, if not uh, between uh, now and then. I hope so. So you wrote in the October issue, you wrote this great article about, it wasn't about firefighting. It wasn't about tactics. It wasn't about ticks. This was about, I guess we can go back to Chief Bruno. This is about simply being nice. Let's talk about that a little bit, please. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting. I, I um, growing up in New York, I love mass transit, right? So uh, around 2020, Fort Worth put in a train from Fort Worth to um, DFW Airport. So I make a quick five minute drive. I'm at the train station, take the train up. Uh, unfortunately, the train schedule uh, is every hour, unlike New York, where it's every eight minutes, give or take. <laughs> so, um, so you know, normally I get in and I can I can catch a train in a in a pretty good fashion. Uh, unfortunately, this particular night, uh, I delays got in really late and ordered up an uber um and uh um you know it's 2 30 2 40 at that point in the morning um everybody's tired and ironically enough uh the trip before the trip to get to that trip i had to order up an uber because i was coming from someplace else and the gentleman was driving kept telling me how tired he was and and like i was at that point where i was uncomfortable i said hey like i need you to pull over because you know it's you're you're suffering sleep deprivation and and i really don't want to be in your car right to now here it is this conversation starts and most uber drivers are pretty quiet right especially the later at night so we just started chatting and and it was just a couple questions you know well, what time did you start how long are you going where have you been tonight any celebrities that's always a question i ask because in <laughs> dallas they're like no you know there's never a celebrity but that's the new york in me i gotta ask that question um so we we just started chatting and then he just kind of started telling me about his philosophies of working right it's about a 35 minute ride at that point maybe 45 minutes at night i know we ran into construction had to go around a loop so we had a little extra time in the car um but it was just interesting you know as, as he was telling me everything um uh, i was you know just kind of listening and said man like there's a lot of good stuff here that could be applied to being uh you know a, a firefighter ems right again uh, uh you know empathy being uh, a challenge these days with some of the calls that just continue to tax the resources uh in all these different communities mm -hmm. Um, but at, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, uh, it's all about being nice. Um, and, and just, you know, um, uh, that person's in your car for a short period of time, just like a firefighter's in a house, you know, hopefully for a short period of time with people, but you know, it's that, it's that one visit that makes a, a difference. Um, you know, and, um, uh, you know, really kind of 
turn my eye to some of the drivers. I've never really had had a few drivers. You know, you could tell somebody was definitely smoking a little weed before I got in a car or, you know, sometimes you see all the dashboard lights which are on. That used to be more of a livery cab thing or livery cab thing. Now it seems to be an Uber thing. Um, so, you know, again, it is what it is. I've had, you know, I've had lights on on my dashboard before and, uh, you know, I just kind of run with it. But uh, when it's a professional showing up uh, um, to pick you up and, and get you home, you know, you you don't want to see that stuff. And this conversation was great. Again, it was the basics, right? They had water for you. They had, which I, I didn't need. I, I want to go to bed when I got home, but they had water. They had a charging cord, you know, uh, just kind of give an update. Like, hey, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Like, they kind of filled me in real quick, or I should say George did. And then um, we just started talking about how people treat them. And, and it's unfortunate. Um, some of the customers he picks up, you know, they they treat them horribly. uh, uh um, you know, they, they make derogatory comments towards him. Uh, they, they get rude to him. Uh, some of them want to stop, right. And he can't technically stop, right. He's everything he's doing is, is a data point on a map somewhere. And if he's right. stopped for nine minutes someplace, uh, a, he's losing money from another, you know, potential fare. Uh, but it also has him getting in questioned about it. So, um, you know, just, just being nice and being gent, you know, a, a genuine person asking questions and, um, you know, I think everybody that gets out of his car, it kind of becomes a, a friend of some sort, you know, just kind of like, again, you, you go on some of these calls and, you know, again, r- riding out all these different places, um, you've got the frequent flyers, uh, but you also have those, those, you know, one time, uh, you know, patients and um, uh, you want to have a, a positive impact. Unfortunately, it's not always going to be that way. And I think right. that's, you know, part of the problem. And, Fortunately for fire and EMS, right, they always have that opportunity to make it a positive outcome. Uh, unlike, unfortunately, you know, a police officer, I, I forget what the percentage was, right? But like a third of the time, uh, or it might even be a greater number, uh, you know, a police interaction is going to be negative because somebody's getting arrested or, you know, some sort of struggle ensues or some sort of, you yeah. know, action takes place that upsets the people where, you know, on a fire EMS call, you know, you, you usually win you know, usually win. So even if it's a, even if it's a loss of, loss of a house or a home or an apartment or whatever it is, usually, you know, you can find some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, whether it's bringing out a purse or some family pictures or a safe, there's something where, you know, uh, that's going to be the one thing they remember you by for the rest of, you know, for their lives. So. Right. And, and I, th- and it's funny because I, I wrote back to you when I, after I read the article to tell you that when we went up in August to Boston, which was my first time traveling, uh in over two years because of the illness and we took a lift from our home to to uh, the airport and then we used lift all around greater boston even though uh, for part of it i mean i I had a rental car but there were times we had to use lift as well and uh when we got back here uh we had a problem because the uh we were told to to go to one stand to be picked up and it turns out that it, it was someplace else and so I was able to reach the driver and he says, don't walk. I'll come to you. Just stay where you are and I'll come over there. And yeah. he came in, came, got there, got out of the car, shook, put it out of his hand. I goes, hi, I'm David. Uh, I'll be driving you today. Let me help you get the bags in and stuff like that. And then we took off and it's only maybe at about, depending on traffic, a half hour drive from the airport to our home in Northwest Broward. But uh, he said, uh, Where'd you guys come from? And uh, we told him, you know, it was a family wedding in Boston. He goes, oh, man, that's one of the cities I really love to visit. He goes, I'm not sure I live there after living in Florida, but I, I love to visit, you know, Boston and New England and be up there in the fall. It was just it's so nice and just led to other things and why he's driving at his age because he's he's put he's putting his fourth daughter through college. Um, wow. And he said, you know, I work, I work a regular eight, nine hour shift during the day and then um, you know, five nights a week, I, I drive just to bring in that extra cash to do it. But we had pleasant conversations about family, about friends, uh, a little bit about the world. But, it, you know, the, the, the ride was over. And, and to me, it was like moments because we had such a pleasant conversation with him. And my wife yeah. was part of the conversation. And, you know, we asked her what she thought about this. It was it was wonderful. And we had used uh, – our kids were still – our daughter and son-in-law was still living in, in, the, in the Lower East Side, we would use Uber up there with them. And I didn't like my daughters necessarily getting into a car with a stranger uh, like that. But 
she said, and he said, no, it's fine. We use it all the time here. It, it works great. And so yeah. we, we started picking up on a little bit. And instead of paying, uh, you know, uh, $30 a day to park the car at the airport, I paid a little more than $30 and two of us got the ride to the airport. Yeah. You know, so it, it was worth it. But to make it, pl- but I think, uh, you know, I'm a big follower of Chief John Vance and Josh Bloom and Nick Brunacini on, on, B, on the B Shifter. But what to me is the most important thing they teach is what Nick's late father did for us in the fire service. Because I used to read his article every month in when when the Dennis, may rest in peace, first published Firehouse Magazine. It was in the firehouse, the volunteer firehouse where I was. And I would make sure I, when it came in, I want to grab it either first, I want to be last because I want to read Chief Bruno's articles. And okay. that's what instilled in me what what he said about the job we, we have to do. Yeah, it can be a dirty job. It can be, as you said, you know, a frequent flyer. But our first requirement is to be safe getting there and be kind to the people who are going through whatever it is the call is we're answering. Yes, we have work to do, but that doesn't take away from us being nice to the citizens who called us because we work for them. Yep. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, I guess over the last, what, maybe two years or so, I mean, we've seen a handful of news stories, uh, you know, that, that I, I, you know, actions are being caught on film and, and, and whatnot, uh, which again, I, I think at this point, if, if you're not aware that somebody's filming you somewhere, you know, that you, you have to be aware of that today, right now, before the next call comes out. Um, you know, but it's interesting just to go back to, you know, you're, you, you know, going to the city, right. And, and you, you know, you, I, I had a hard time switching from a taxi to an Uber. Right. Cause I just, yeah, I was big business, you know, and, and, and the taxi drivers are, you know, but, the taxi drivers are usually independent and, you know, they're already paying a, a huge sum of money for a tax license every year, just, just for the pleasure to drive you or the, uh, the ability to drive you. So it was interesting uh, because one of the things I learned, and I live here in a college city in Fort Worth, and, you know, there's been some stories, um, you know, about people not getting picked up or people picking up the wrong people, um, you know, and I, it's a, it's a positive, it's a minus, right? The, the big positive is all, everything that that driver does is, recorded right so uh you know if there's some actions that should be taking place that shouldn't be taking place you know they can tell what's going on so you know there's that um but what i'm realizing is a lot of these people are doing the hustle right and and actually when i used to live in minnesota uh um i had a a che cab was was the driver at the time and and she lived like two miles down the road i usually took the 5 a.m 6 a.m flights which always a good idea until the night before um, but she was solid. Right. And like, literally it's just, I, I, I was looking for a driver when I got divorced, I didn't have, you know, my, my regular driver and it just was a waste of money to park at the airport. So I was following her on Twitter. We started, you know, uh, I started having her pick me up all the time. And like, no matter if it was one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, like, and I still, I still follow her on Twitter. And like, she's the epitome of customer service, right? Like she's following your flight. She knows when you're coming in. She, she knows about you, especially if you're obviously a repeat customer. Um, but you know, she makes that arrival from a 3 a.m. flight or, you know, having to get up at four o'clock in the morning for a 6 a.m. flight um, makes it just a little bit better. Right. Start your day off really well or end your day really well. So, um, you know, it's. um, It's just like when you knock on a door, right? Like I said in the article, you don't you the folks probably don't know you. There's a good chance you don't know those folks, right? The stranger thing. And and they're allowing you inside their house. Um, you know, they're they're trusting you to be inside the house. And and there's a lot that comes with that. And and again, like I, I want to get to the airport or I do want to get home safely. Like it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but then you see, you know, there's again, depending on you know how often you follow the media, you know, there's plenty of people that are unlicensed that are driving vehicles nowadays. You just don't know. So, you know, having that little bit of extra courtesy and uh um uh, kindness just just goes a long way um whether it's a two minute interaction or you know you're stuck in a car 45 minutes with somebody i mean it's that's a long time and, and in a generation now like you know especially post covid right like people are struggling to chat with other people uh you know it's it's unco- it's it's common right i get on a plane 
rarely do I talk to the person next to me. I don't usually engage, right? It's just, it's a different time, right? Communications at a different time. So you're literally in their personal car. It's not their, you know, their work vehicle. You're in their personal car, which they have a sense of pride in, right? Because they're driving you around in it. Um, and I think it takes it to a new level. So yeah, I wish everybody could be like George. I think, I think life would be a little bit better if we had a lot more Georges out there. Right. I, I agree. And I think sometimes um, I would say when we get on the scene, because the excitement, the adrenaline, et cetera, sometimes we accidentally turn off the nice switch and we want to get to work. And that's what we need to do, depending on the situation right away. But sometimes we also need to remember that, you know, if this is, unless it's a abandoned building, and of course today, what we think are abandoned buildings may not be so abandoned when we get on scene. But the fact is that we have to remember that their people are calling us because they need us, or in their minds they they need us, and we're answering that that call, and we have to remember that it's. For the most part, even if it's a house fire, it's a human-based issue that's that's bringing them to yeah. you know to reach out to us, and so you can't just you know. Well, I want to tell you about no. Shut up and let me do my job. Get over to the side of the street and let us do our job. You can't do that. You have to. They're already upset from the moment they dial nine one one, whether it's a medical rescue or fire or whatever it is. They're going to be upset, and our job is to reduce that anxiety a bit so they can take a breath and we can do our job but i think sometimes we forget about taking care of that person having somebody you know not every firefighter can just stop what they're doing and walk over to them and say hi we're here what can we do for you but whoever the, the liaison is going to be with the family whether it's the first two officer or it's going to be a, a battalion chief coming in needs to get to that family and get information from them and tell them, yeah, we understand and we're here to help you. You got to, we got to take those couple of moments, find a way to get those moments on these type of calls that, you know, people are going to be upset. You know, again, we saw, you know, I haven't been a Dick Wolf, big Dick Wolf fan other than law and order. But when I saw LA County fire and rescue this summer, I was truly impressed again because it brought me back to, and I'm a little bit older than you, my days, originally watching emergency mm -hmm. and even though i didn't plan on being a firefighter and it happened by accident it was that was part of the what propelled me to go ahead and do it when i was offered to join the the department because i saw what emergency was doing la county was doing and all the episodes are based on actual calls that la county had had responded to and they were wonderful to share all that information with jack webb and bob senator and things like that but it taught us, at least it taught me, and I'm sure I'm not alone. I'm sure there are thousands out there who watched the show originally and still watch it today, as I, I still do, that we can still be firefighters and paramedics. And we can still be nice to the people when we respond to their calls. Are we going to have topsy-turvy calls, even though we try to be nice? Yeah, but that's Absolutely. that's with other people. You, know, you can't, We can't gauge every single person to be the same. But... We can't lose, that should be the number one item in our tool belt on every call is being nice to the reporting person because they're only calling us because they need us for something. Yeah, and it's, it, it's again tough, right? Society has changed. People's actions towards other people have changed. Uh, you know, these, these situations, I mean, unfortunately, we're just seeing more and more, you know, situations of violence as we approach uh, you know, December, I have to think of what happened in Webster, uh, you know, outside of Rochester, where the firefighters were shot and killed, um, you know, and, and interestingly enough, right, like something similar happened to my father when I was actually, I was in elementary school and the school next to uh, my father worked for transportation department. So his office was right next to my school. So every time, you know, we we're at at lunch at recess, I'd bounce over and see him. And uh, one day they, they had a call for a nosebleed and ended up, uh, my father just, you know, like normally would do right. Walked over, went in the house to see what was going on, knew the family. And, uh, uh, the gentleman pulled a gun and, uh, he was, uh, just not happy with life. And my father was able to talk his way out. Right. I remember they, they, they pulled us out of the school. They put us all on the other side of the school. Nobody knew what was going on. 
And, you know, again, listen, it's, you know, it's that it's that once in a lifetime call that we hope nobody gets. But, you know, we're seeing more of that, too. So I, I get it. It's tough. You you have to go in guarded, but also, you know, open at the same time. Um, you know, I'm actually working with somebody right now on just a, an article um, about what to do after a fire. Right. Because, again, I think. Uh, People have to get back, right? They got to get back. They got to decon. They got to get their rigging service, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff to do, and uh, I'm not saying I've seen it happen. You know, I've heard a couple stories. I've, you know, I've heard some folks that you know have told me when they when I tell them where I work, and they're like, oh yeah, my house burned down, and then you know they 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 left, and that was it. And like we were waiting for Red Cross, right? And again, like even that Red Cross has changed since COVID, right? A lot of places they don't necessarily go out to the scene anymore. You now get somebody's phone number, and, and Red Cross, you know, says go to this hotel and you know, there'll be some gift cards there for you in a little bit. And like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough time to suffer an emergency because the way things are, I mean, go to a hospital, same thing, right? You're, you're behind that glass partition and, you know, uh, you check out, we'll email you the next steps. And it's like, Hey, you know, what about somebody who needs a hand being held, you know, uh, elderly folks or, you know, somebody that just has never experienced something like that before. And they need that little bit of extra, you know, boost, but, you know, fire companies have to get back because, companies are being cut or, you know, there's short staffing or, you know, run volumes or again, even the decom process right after a good job, it's going to be hour, hour and a half to get everything cleaned up. So you want to get back and get back in service. Uh, so you, you know, tend to take up a lot quicker than, than in the past. So, you know, even something like that is leaving a fire. Like that's just an article that we're working on right now. Um, I think is, is really important to kind of share with the folks. So. Yeah, it is. And I remember uh, when I was up and visiting uh, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, because that's where my wife's um, uh, sister and her family live outside of Philly. And uh, by the way, folks, be, speaking of Philly, I want to remind you that next Tuesday, our uh, interview for Five Alarm Task Force is with Commissioner Adam Teal of the uh, City of Philadelphia Fire Department, who I've been after f- for a long time to get on the show because um, our our the TV the the dramatic series that we proposed for television about the fire service was based on the the uh, fire marshal's office with C- city of philadelphia fire department and uh the film and tv office loved the the pilot script so that city has been near and dear to me visiting uh, my wife's family up there and uh, i'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to to uh interview him next week now one of the things that he is also big on is the whole concept of customer service and and i've you know a number of the chiefs that have been grace, gracefully accepted my invitation have talked about that as well. And that, because that is what we do. We we're actually, we give customer service. Uh, the d- difference is that we may just d- not know our customers in certain circumstances. If you're in a big city, maybe there's a chance you might run into somebody, but if you're in a smaller community or you're in a volunteer community, part pay, uh, there's a good chance you're going to know people that you go to, to help. And that happened when I was in upstate New York. That was uh, because of my position in the synagogue. I knew a lot of people in our fire district, even though it was a small district. But I probably had in in the three and a half years, I probably had over a dozen calls to people's home that I knew. Yeah. And um, and one of them was, unfortunately, it was a fatality. We couldn't revive the gentleman. But the family was so relieved that I was, I happened to be on that call because they knew me from the synagogue and they knew that not only did I work hard to try to uh, resuscitate the husband and father, but they knew that ritually I could still, I could help them while I was there, just taking off my helmet, taking off my bunker coat. And I then I became Steve, the synagogue guy, and was able to help them through what they had yeah. to go through. And, you know, for the next year and a half, I kept getting cards like every six weeks or so thanking me for being there and help, helping them out. That's nice. That, and you know, you couldn't, you couldn't pay for that kind of response. It's just because we were nice. And I, I think that chief Bruno's lessons need to be the very first thing we discuss when we do a training that our first job in our communities is to be nice to the people we serve. Yeah, there are going to be people, as you said, there are going to be crappy calls and very troubling calls and calls that we need help from our brothers in blue and our, and our brothers in green and white. But 
we still have to be nice. Because if we're not, again, if it's a small town, everybody's going to hear about it. Yeah. And yeah. if it's if it's a larger place, the chief might wind up hearing about it. So, you know, and not that we did something wrong. It's just that, that person was in a foul mood and took something we said or took something we did in, in the wrong way. And then they complain about it. And we've all gone through that. You know, this is part of, as you said, part of life. But I think that it's incumbent upon us as public servants. Again, doesn't make any difference if your career or volunteer or part pay, even WUI. We are public servants. And, and that's why this article hits so deep for me, because it is so important, especially as you just said today. Today's a different world than it was at you know January 1st of 2020. Yeah. Everything's been turned upside down. We, we in our generation, never saw anything like this for the most part. And uh, we were, for the most, we, we were running around like chickens with our heads cut off in the barnyard. So uh, that article really made me think that the best way is that if we just start off with our first step being, being nice, we can do everything yeah. after that. And we're, we're, we're good. We, we know what our jobs are. We do the very, very best we can. We always give our best. But if we don't take care of our client at that moment, then we lose our credibility. And the last thing we want is for them not to want to call us. I had, cause they had a lousy meeting prior to that. Yeah. And they really, maybe they, the second time they really, really need us. And we just have to remember that. And I think that's who we got to be. Yes, we're professionals. Yes, we go through hours and hours and hours of training, hours and hours of practice, classes, conventions, local, regional, national, to learn and learn and learn. But the basic, you know, you're not going to open up a can of frosting and, and just eat that, right? We, we bake a cake and we smear the frosting yeah. on the cake. So you can't just be the one thing because you're dealing with people 99% of the time. Yeah. Yes, we all have animal calls, 99% of the time. Let's start out by being nice about it and go from there and learn from Peter's article in the October issue of Firehouse and what we've talked about today. So uh, remember that, please. Uh, it doesn't hurt to be nice. It doesn't cost you anything either. Maybe a few seconds, a minute or two. But boy, the return could be amazing. And that's the key. We have to remember all right, so uh, let's let's move on now, and let's talk about uh, another issue that you and I have kind of touched on, and the magazine has been doing a great job covering both career and volunteer issues, because right now, both of our ranks are sorely depleted. And, uh, and I, I quote him again every time we talk about retention and recruitment, because I used to call it recruitment and retention, and our good friend... Chief Anthony Correa was the one who corrected me when he said, Steve, it's got to be retention and recruitment. And I said, why? He says, because if we can't keep the people we have, how the hell are we going to get anybody else to come in? And I said, you know, Chief, <laughs> I never valid thought that way. Yeah, it's a valid yeah. point. So both, both sides of this coin are facing tough times. We see uh, departments, paid departments, putting ads all over the country, trying to bring in new people. Uh, we see the volunteer, NVFC, the Vol National Volunteer Fire Council, working their tushies off to help, again, prepare materials that volunteer departments can do. You and I both know that the concept of volunteerism has changed dramatically over the years. You know, I started back in the mid 70s, where, you know, you were almost deputy king if you became a volunteer firefighter. In these yeah, small you, communities, you were in that town, yeah, yeah, and uh, and the c community was always backing you up. They, they they had your back. They cared. Society has changed. You know, my, my day, yes, my wife worked, but we didn't have any kids, and I worked 60, 70 hours a week at my job, but still donated my time to the fire service. And I think that today, you know, we find most. Uh, married families, each parent, probably both parents are working most of the time. At least one parent is probably doing 
another part-time job, and maybe the second one's doing part-time as well as full-time. And the kids, well, they have all these after-school programs and stuff like that, but then they have their homework and stuff. It's difficult for a parent to break away to volunteer today. And at the same time, our departments, our career departments, are being shorted on budgets that they really need. They don't have, you know, we saw what just what happened with Atlanta, where thankfully the trades and, and general news picked up how difficult they were, the situation they were in with, with not having equipment they could use and yeah. how it was raising response times and other problems. And last week we got to see the good news that the city of Atlanta created a tremendous grant for both the fire, fire service and their police department, which were sorely needed. But Atlanta's still a big city, and they put up a lot of money. So how, how do you see and that what we can do to uh, keep the people that we have, encourage them to stay? It doesn't just have to be, we'll just give them a bigger check. Yeah, we'd all love to do that. If the means were there to do it. But the communities are being very didactic about how much money, how much taxes they want to pay and how much they want to pay for their fire service or police coverage, things like that. So they don't want to see budgets go up by you know $10 million that, higher than the previous year. So we're, we're caught in almost like a, a sticky spider web. How, how, do, how do you see us being able to move through the, the crisis that, that we're in. We'll start, we'll start with this topic now, and we'll take the break during it. But I think it was yeah. uh, apropos to move right into this because, you know, again, sometimes the people who are against us getting more money in our department are people who we service and may not have been at our top game when we help them. And they see that as why should I give them more money? Because they didn't, they weren't able to help me when I was here. So why are they going to help anybody else? So what's yeah. your opinion there? Well, I, you know, we'll need a couple hours, uh, so we'll take two or three breaks between now and the end of that one. So, you know, it was interesting. Um, it was a wing spread in in July of 2021, and that was uh, it's every five years a, a group gets together and. Uh, Really, they deep dive uh, into, you know, the, the the fire service today and, you know, five, 10 year look. And, you know, unfortunately, I was a day late. My my one flight to Milwaukee that day was canceled. Literally, I could not find another. I, I'm going from here to Milwaukee. I thought I could get into Chicago, nothing. So I missed the first day and, and you know, rolled in kind of, you know, uh, uh, mid morning, the second day. So um, first breakout group we had was was about, you know, staffing and. Um, it was confusing. I think, you know, my first question was, are we strictly focused on the fire service or are we looking at volunteer and career? Because everybody in that room was on the career side. And it wasn't a knock towards one side or the other. It just so happened to be that the room I was in. And we started talking about it. And it's crazy because everyone's like, oh, we can't, you know, we're losing people left and right. We can't keep people. We're doing tests. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote, I think it was in August of 21, the column was what's going on? Because you know, by the end of that meeting, and then I was at another meeting a few weeks later, um, and then at FRI, um, and and that was 21. So that would have been FDIC. So there was a lot of events like every week because the world just kind of had reopened. And it, it's literally the same conversation, right? We can't keep, we're losing people. You know, they're losing assistant chiefs with, with two years until, you know, they max their pension. Volunteers can't recruit, you know, uh, after a year of, you know, stations being shuttered because of COVID, I mean, I live in Texas and everything was kind of opened up by what, May or June, uh, you know, but volunteer stations in New York were still shut down March and April of 2021, you know, a full year later. So, so people kind of lost that sense of camaraderie and it's, it's gone. I mean, a lot of places it's truly, you know, it's still lost, it's still gone. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. You know I, I, it's, you have to be very, you know, specific at what you're looking at, right? Because there's the volunteer side, there's the career side. Um, I think, you know, the combination side has fared pretty decent, right? Because some people are kind of dabbling, right? Uh, you know, I don't know if I want to be a firefighter or not. Some people say it's great. So they they do a part-time, right? They take their training, they do one shift a week. 
Um, and I think, you know, I think that, that's a key in volunteer departments where it's applicable. That's, that's the catch, right? So uh, when I moved to Maryland and, and did my short six months in a fire company there, uh, I'll never forget. They're like, yeah, which night do you want to choose? I said, well, I guess I'll come down Tuesday, Thursday, you know, and they said, no, you just have to do one night, one night. That's it. Yeah. That was the best thing, you know, because now that kind of gave me, you know, I, I lived 15 minutes from the station. Um, but now like I really only had to worry about one night or two nights a week. And when that's applicable, that's great. Unfortunately, you know, that or fortunately that's going to take care of the bulk of the calls, right? Just like anything else with the insurance policy, having a fire department, you having three to six people on a duty crew is the best thing I think that you could do. But when you're, you know, if you're running 80 calls a year, you know, that's a tough one, right? Um, but, you know, that sense of duty crew, that's when you're going to guarantee some training. Uh, that's when you're going to guarantee some camaraderie. You're going to guarantee, uh, you know, people are being brought up to speed as to what's going on. You guarantee staffing. And that's that's what it's about at the end of the day, right? It's about responding to that emergency. Um so I think, you know, duty crews where applicable is is really a really good solution on the volunteer side. Um, you know, uh, Jay Jester, he's out of Maryland. He wrote a great article. It was brief, but it was about one of his article or one of his classes that he does. And it was called Taming the Tigers of Transition. And I think it's an honest assessment that places have to have. You know, um, uh, I know of a place that, uh, you know, they, they, they have a, a full time medic. I think it's like 18 hours a day now, but they just, you know, inscribed full, you know, 100 percent volunteer on their trucks. So they didn't want to put the person on 24 seven. And it's like, but do you realize that, like at some point, you know, somebody in your family might have a really bad outcome because you wrote 100% volunteer in your rig and you didn't want to be that way. And there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Again, I mean, you know, coming from a family of volunteers, it's, it's great, you know, but times have changed and you, and you have to look at that. And, and, you know, Jay's piece was, is great because it really, you have to ask those hard questions, whether you're a chief or you're an incoming chief. Um, you know, um, I couldn't tell you how many times this year it's, it's gotta be 20, 25 times. We've seen departments primarily in the Northeast shut down, right? Whether it's an accounting issue, uh, whether it's um, a financial issue, whether it's a lack of certified, you know, firefighters, uh, whether uh, or not there's accountability to the community. Now, listen, there's some of that, that, you know, small town politics, there's nothing you can do. Uh, but, you know, when there's an accounting issue, that's where you, you know, you, you take that 26 year old or the 32 year old and let them be a fire chief or an officer and and let an older person in the community, you know, uh, who doesn't necessarily want to be an active responder, take on that role. I mean, and that's that's not anything new. But I think right now, if, if you want to sustain the volunteer model, that's one of the things you really have to do. You have to shop, you know, shop for the um, the board of trustees or commissioners or, you know, the uh, the e-board or whatever you want to call it, um, the administrative side of the department. You have to look outside, you know, don't bog those folks down. Um, you know, the, the folks are my or the parents where my folks live. They do like a pizza sale, right? They, they have no restaurants in there. They have one restaurant, but it's like kind of open, kind of closed. It's never really, I've never been by it where it's open. <laughs> but the fire chief said to me one day, he goes, yeah, we've got the best pizza in town. I said, really? He says, oh, yeah, absolutely. And he goes, and then when we sell wings, we have the best wings in town. I said, really? Well, come to find out. Yeah, it's because it's the only restaurant in town. But think about that. I mean, that's, that's you know, five or six days a, a year. These people have to take off time from their jobs, take away a Friday from their family and all the prep work that goes into it, right? On the Wednesday, Thursday before, and then Saturday having to come back and finish cleaning. But, you know, they want to volunteer, they want to help, but then they have to find the money and that, that's a broken system. And, and again, I don't know what the, there is no answer, right? I don't think anybody right. has that because every single community is different. Um, what, what I've seen here in Texas is these um, emergency services taxing districts, they seem to work out pretty well, right? It's kind of a win-win. Um, so, you know, recruitment uh, recruitment is key, but I think, you know, Tony definitely has it right. Retention is the best thing, right? Why why spend time chasing people that you have to train when you can spend that time re retaining the people that are already trained? And on the career side, I think, you know, it's just, I think you, there has to be a lot more transparency in the hiring. I mean, I've heard what I would deem a nightmare story, right? Like a firefighter shows up and, and it's five o'clock and he's asking his officer like, hey, where's, uh, it's his first shift. He says, uh, where's my, uh, where's my replacement? Where's my relief? And they said, well, you know, be here about six o'clock in the morning. And I said, well, we were in the academy. We left the firehouse at five. I didn't realize we work overnight. Like, yeah, man, it's a 24 hour shift. 
and within a within two weeks, that guy was off the job because his family didn't want him, you know, away at nights. And I, I mean, that's that's a worst case scenario, but you know, it's happened more than at once, right? So you have that, but then you also have you know the glitz and glamour of the backdraft poster type job. When in reality, it is the you know pulling a a, a kitten out of a sewer, or you know, again, is it fulfilling? Yeah, but it's not. It's not what it was. Um, you know, and then. In places where you have fire based DMS, I mean, you see you see a lot of that burnout, right? Because somebody being stuck on an ambulance, and I shouldn't say stuck, but assigned to an ambulance for twelve or fifteen years, um, you know, there's got to be some some give or take. And I was at an event; it was actually a virtual roundtable during COVID. So I asked the this this chief, he ran a fire based, pretty big fire based DMS system, and I said. Like what are your you know what do your engine and truck and rescue firefighters do during the day? Like do they get time for PT? Yeah, each company has uh, one hour. Uh, figure forty five minutes of of PT, followed by fifteen minutes to get showered up, get cleaned up. Uh, where they're pretty much out of service. I'm like wow, that's you know that's pretty cool. So what about the ambulance? No, no, you know their <laughs> their goal is to keep that ambulance on the street you know as much as possible. I said, well, don't they need that? And I said, well, you know, and the chief. I think you kind of realize like, hey, you're right, you know, and he goes, well, they're getting their PT by working out, lifting people all day. But even at that point, the PT is more like just physical, uh, you know, physical sure. training. That you can yeah. Rely. yeah, it's like, you know, so something like that where you really I think, you know, places like that that are running that busy, um, you know, they really have to look at that, whether, you know, they split those calls up. Um, but, you know, on a career side, it's just going to come back to money. Uh, and on the recruitment side, I mean, there was uh, there's a city here in the DFW area. I think they ran was a four. I wrote about it. They wrote they ran four tests last year, and they couldn't hire forty positions. Like it just it doesn't. And I don't know. Nobody could figure it out, right? Like why is it not? You know, five years ago it was the coveted job, right? And maybe maybe everybody used to say, I'm you know, I'm living the dream, and I, I you know I had work at America's best kept secret. Maybe the secret got out, and that's that's part of the reason why. Um, you know, but I, uh, I just wrote in Rochester in, in New York, you know, and, and that's going to be interesting because they're going from days and nights. I think they're one of the last departments in the country to still work, you know, tens and fourteens, and they're going to be going to 24s pretty soon. Um, and I mean, I don't think it's going it, to, everybody in the County, Monroe County, where they're at, that that's career, you know, is doing at least a 24, if not a 48 shift. Um, but I, you know, I wonder what that's going to do to the department um, because they do a really good job of making sure that the crews on days, you're, you know, are getting training, right? They might pull engine five out of service, uh, uh, you know, for three hours to do, you know, live fire training or something like that. But the city is staffed for that. Well, now when all of a sudden you have this 24 shift, you know, this 24 hour shift, um, I think that, you know, that might change some things up. And, and, and I remember one firefighter was talking about it and said, yeah, the divorce rate is going to go up in the city, uh, you know, kidding, but you know, it's going to, it's going to completely shift the way things are going, but in order for them to attain, you know, future recruits, they have to be able to keep up with that because right now I think they're working, you know, like 18 days a month, right. Almost, almost like an office job type uh, environment. Maybe it's a day or two less. Um, so I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I it just it's 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 something the fire service has never seen, which has been the norm, right? That the norm over the last three years is 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 uh, oh, it is unprecedented, right? And um, it's still a phenomenal job. I mean, you know, sometimes there's leadership issues, but that's going to happen whether it's an office job, a fire job, police job. Exactly. You know, uh, I think the best crew may be like, like the roadside, you know, assistance guys because they're out by themselves, kind of like a police officer, but they don't have a sergeant, you know, breathing down right, their back. Right. Um, but you know, it's 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 just all changed but you know the again is the accountability is greater than it's ever been um you know whether it's you being on camera or you know you filing your reports or you know with online training you you know there's really no way for you to miss on training you could you know i think a few years ago you can kind of skate by and do one or two things you didn't want to do but you know that accountability is greater than it's ever been and that makes it a challenge for some folks but you know to see somebody walk away after a 15 year career in, in the, on the, you know, the paid side or, you know, even 18 or 19 years in the volunteer side, um, you know, there's gotta be a way to, to still, you know, keep that experience there um, for when it's needed. Uh, right. And, and, right. you know, 
maybe they, they lessen the requirements, right? If you're, if you're 10 years or less than the volunteers, you have to meet this requirement set and, you know, 15, 10 to 15 is this. And uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was like that up in, 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 um, on a Noggin County for you, Steve, but like, I think it's 20 or 25 years, your life status at that point, you know, you don't really have to make those requirements, but those, those bylaws are from the fifties or sixties when, you know, an ambulance call was like a big deal, right. You know, uh, or fire was, you know, uh, fire was a, you know, big deal. Now it's, you know, everything else, the automatic alarms and it's tough. It's, yeah, you know, it is so. very true. All right. Let's take a break here, folks. Cause when we come back, I'm going to ask Peter, I'm going to talk about what we talked, what my prior guest last week, uh, Dr. Gama, Gamaliel Bear, uh, posits as maybe a, a different way for our hiring process, how we're looking at for both career and volunteer. Um, and I think you'll like what you have to hear. So we're going to take a break here and we'll be back with our guest, Peter Matthews, right after these words. As always, please stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alum Task Force. I'm Steve Green, your host. With me, my guest today is Peter Matthews. He is the editor-in-chief and uh, conference director for Firehouse, Firehouse Magazine, Firehouse.com. And by the way, if you don't get the daily news blast from Firehouse.com, you should be. Okay? I'm just going to say it that way. If you're a firefighter or fire buff, you want to know what's jumping and come, jumping off the page in the fire service on a day-by-day basis, weekday, and that is the fire Firehouse News Blast. Look for it. Sign up for it. It is something, it's a very important tool in our nonprofit because we're looking for the LODIs and the LODDs so that we can reach out to that injured firefighter or the family of a firefighter who who made the ultimate sacrifice, we can offer a disbursement uh, to them. So the firehouse.com news blast is something that is not just do I love reading in general, but now for the last almost three years, we use it as part of our research to help our our, our brothers and sisters and or their families in dire need. So please, I, I can't recommend strongly enough, get this news blast. It's very important to keep us appraised of what's going on basically on a day-by-day basis. And, of course, the website will even often have more information. We might get referred back there, but there may be a larger article there. So make sure you take time to go to the website, firehouse.com, as well, because there's often more there. And, of course, there's lots of other stuff there. There's the training part. Uh, Our mutual good friend, uh, Captain Mike Daly, um, and I heard a very cute story about your your first meeting with uh, Firefighter Daily. <laughs> back, I don't know anything about it. I know, you know, yeah, it's gone. The memory, that's it. I'm getting older. But uh, yeah, Mike, just, he's just a great guy, a great teacher. and Phenomenal. You know, he's one of the firefighters that I've, I've said, I'd go through the gates of hell with him as my officer in a heartbeat, you know. And to hear how successful he was, I said, you know, how did it go? with your classes. He goes, it was the best classes I ever got to do. He said, we, it was so big that Peter had to go find a bigger room for us because we had more people than we could fit in that classroom. We were dragging chairs across the hall. I've never done that before. Yeah. After we moved him into the other room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah that was, that was pretty and, good. And, and that's great to hear because not only is that great for him, but it's great that the people are there for the firehouse conference and they, they're getting this from, being at a national conference like like Firehouse Expo, when I'm, I have no doubt that Fire Fusion coming up in 2024 is going to be as good, if not even a notch higher than what we're used to at uh, at Expo. And I'll forever be gr- great, be in gratitude to Firehouse Expo because it was uh, the one in Baltimore in 2000 where I first met Chief Dennis Rubin and the late Chief. Alan Rudmasini. And I was in such awe uh, of meeting him. And uh, it was just, it was a in the hallway opportunity, but I, I wouldn't have passed it up because I've been reading him 
already since 77. So it was it was great to have the opportunity to meet him and just chat for two or three minutes with him. And uh, I think, again, you know, we, we mentioned this before about being nice, but if you haven't read Chief Brunacini's books, you, you should. If the fire service means anything to you more than a paycheck, read Chief Brunacini's b- b- books because you learn so much about being, not the tactics necessarily, but about being a firefighter and what it takes for us to do that. So let's get back to our discussion with retention and recruitment. And as I mentioned, uh, our, our, our mutual acquaintance, uh, Dr. Gamali Elbert, uh, had this essay where he said, DEI, uh, diversity, um, all of a sudden I'm just blanking out now. Equity and inclusion. Equity and inclusion, all right, should be the the focus, should just expand a little bit to include the body, the mind, and the soul. Now, in many ways that makes sense because the body is very important. There is a lot of physicality in being a firefighter. It's not sitting in the nice, comfy chairs you see on television, staying on your Kindle or on your phone. It, there is a lot of work in the firehouse you have to do. There's a lot of training you have to do. And you have to be ready for really strong, long, drawn-out, physically exhausting calls that you may be on. And if you're not in good shape, you're not going to be able to do it or do it correctly or do it for length needed. So body makes a lot of sense mind what do we grade do we grade a a prospective applicant just with a 25 question written test where you put yes or no x a box and that tells us everything we know about we should know about that person this applicant who wants to be join our department and equity let's what is it we have to be equal you know finally finally we you know it's taking well over 30 years to get a, a decent percentage of women in the fire service, but we need more. And their interest is more. They want to do it. And why, if they're physically able to do it, they have the mind, body, and spirit to do it, then why the hell aren't we bringing more women in to the fire service as well? Yes, yes, I'm one of the old guys, right? I've been out since most of you have been in. But the fact is that times have changed. As as Peter said in the first segment, you know, we're looking at a different world today than even we had in 2020. Our attitudes are different. Our emotions are different. Our nerves are different today. But we need to work to make sure we have the right staffing, the right amount of staffing, the right people doing the job who are there for the right reason, and protecting providing that protection to our communities that we take that oath to do. So what what is your feeling about this idea of DEI, including mind, body, and spirit? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's the holistic approach, right? And and, and I think that's, that's part of it. Um, uh, I think DEI is very confusing, right? There's six different ways to look at it. Uh, um, it, you know, it, it, some say it comes from the business world. Some say that it comes from, you know, uh, uh, you know, city governments. You know, it's so we don't even really understand the root of it. Um, I think most of us don't know what the goal is. And, and again, it's really looking outside the box. I think, you know, there's a lot of that, um, you know, and it's, it's, again, I just, I was writing uh, er, earlier this year, I think it was in the spring. And, um, uh, right with a gentleman who had been on about two years and we were chatting and I said, Oh, did, you know, there was a high school program. Did you get that high school program? And, uh, uh, he said, no, is so it was a high school program. It was a, I think you had to enter in your sophomore year. So you had to apply in the freshman year, but it was only every three years. Right. So it's unfortunate, right? If you were, if you were a year too old or a year too young, you missed this opportunity to essentially get into this high school program. And then, uh, you know, at 18, have uh, a job opportunity as long as you pass the test because they they were at the top of the line because they they did want to hire from within the city, city residents. Um, and uh, he was in a position where he asked about it and he literally was told, oh, yeah, that's not something you'd be interested in. So uh, his classmates got hired, you know, because he, he would have been eligible. And um, 
Uh, so he had to wait till he was like 24, you know, and he had a decent job, but he's like, all my friends are saying how great this job is. And, um, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, he was late. He's, he's jealous of his friends. And so he's been on, I think about two years, but, you know, he said he talked to his teachers and the teacher said, ah, it's not for you. Just move on. And, and didn't even give him an opportunity. Right. Like, um, so I, you know, it's, it's, it's reaching out to, you know, younger ages and, and, one of the things I really talked about before the break, right, is, again, I think one of the places that, that folks are, I mean, it, it's not new, but it's a much more um, desired approach right now for hiring is looking at the schools, right? Like, I think there was a, a few years where they would go after D1 athletes or really any any college athletes, right? Because they already have that aspect of it. Uh, I, I'm not one to say anything about health and wellness, but they've got that aspect of, they're dedicated, you know, they understand the importance of physical fitness. They have a drive, they have a desire, they want to improve, they want to get their times better, their, you know, breathing better, whatever it is that they're doing in their respective sport. Um, so that's been one thing. But now, you know, you have these schools, and I just, we worked with two or three in Columbus, they were at like regional vocational schools. Um, and they're essentially fire programs, right? Same thing. They're, you know, they're putting you in, in a program at, at, uh, ninth grade and you go through a couple of years by the time you graduate you have fire one you have emt now again do they have all the experience that they need at age 18 you know do you ever have the experience you need, right exactly. i mean that, that's the great you know you never stop learning um and there is a debate about that and i understand that but like you're getting them into the pipeline you know if they're going to be and, and i know it's not i know daly's given that term uh chris Browski's also used the term steve chris Browski, you know the 220 year firefighter right there's that. Um, but then there's also, you know, if, if you get these people at the high school level um, into your ranks and you know that their background is what you want, that's a win, right? You know, you they already understand kind of what's going on. Again, I don't, I don't think anybody really ever truly understands what it is until you retire um, what's going on. But you do that. And, um, uh, you know, so that's a great way to do it. And I, I remember when I used to live in Minnesota, there was a program, uh, one of the local fire chiefs said, hey, come down to the fire academy, whatever day it is. Um, there's a really cool story. These firefighters are in from Sweden. I think it was Sweden. But, okay, cool. You know, so I met them and I'm walking around. And I thought they were just giving these kids a tour. Well, they were they were high school program. Yeah, it was a high school program. So essentially there, you know, they they selected in eighth grade kind of their career path, right? So in New York, we call it BOCES, uh, you know, yeah. uh, I know it's VOTEC and, and, you know, depending on where you are in the region, it's it's technical, you know, schools. But in eighth grade, they chose a career path that they wanted. And the rest of their high school career was preparing them for whatever it is, you know, a firefighter, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever it is. But these these kids, I spoke to them and I, I interviewed them all. And they, it was like the trip of a lifetime. They were on a, I think it was a two and a half month trip. It was like 10, 11 weeks. Wow. And they started in the West Coast. So they, they flew in. They went to the Pacific North. Actually, I think they might have been like in Vancouver in Washington or in Canada. I'm sorry. And they did like a week and a half of Wildland. Right. And then they, they bounced down to someplace in California. Then they went out to Montana um, for like search and rescue, uh, you know, uh, uh, forestry stuff. Uh, and then they made their way to Minneapolis and they spent a week in Minneapolis. And I've never seen a more tight knit group, a more focused group. And like they were <laughs> they were just killing it in the fire ground and you know some of them were i guess at that point they were 17 or 18 because some of them can graduate a year early depending on how, how they get their stuff done but like they were they were a machine they were a well-oiled machine and um two or three of them reached out you know after the article and you know a few years later i was just i was cleaning up emails and i was like hey like hey what whatever happened like where where did you end up and you know some of them stayed in the fire some of them didn't uh, one of them had started like a little company. I mean, they, they were from a small town, you know, like they was caught, their school was almost like a boarding school. So they were all in, you know. Um, so not all of them stuck out. Some of them still volunteered in their communities, which is great. And, you know, at that point, they're going to be lifelong volunteers. If they went through that right. program and the bonds they built, you know, with kids from all over the, the, the country, like they're they're there for life. And um, but it was just fascinating, you know, so 
that was that was five to six, seven years of formal education on that topic. But when they left, they were ready to go. Um, and then, you know, they also have college over there. So, you know, college is kind of like some of those fundamentals, whether it's the, you know, the, I don't want to say English, but, it, you know, the the language, the writing skills, the history skills, the the mechanical skills that they learn earlier. Um, so, I mean, that, that would be a cool program that'll never float here in the U.S., right? But, I mean, I think, you know, those technical schools, which what they have in Ohio and BOCES in New York, uh, the Explorer programs are still super popular yeah. in California. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, and, and I mean, I grew up uh, for the two years I lived in upstate New York, um, you know, in the Explorer program, the schools didn't really recognize it or make it a sanctioned program, right? You could be a member of the cross-country team and have X dedicated hours to to go running or, you know, basketball, swimming, whatever it was. But if, you know, if if you needed a day off to go to an event for the Explorers, you kind of had to tap out, right? Like, and it would have made sense to have some of that stuff during the day, you know, I think, um, you know, kind of as a bonus, but also an opportunity to get other, other you know, Explorers together. So, um, you know, some of that stuff, I think, is the future of building the next generation, the next, next generation, right? I don't even know what the next generation is called at this point. Um, when you, when you go that route, but, you know, again, I think, uh, the, the kids under 18 or people under 18, they're a lot more open than, than, than people over 2025. 20, I mean, just life is, life is completely different. Right. Sure. Um, and I, th- I think that's going to help as some of these agencies look to, you know, diversify their ranks. And again, I think the, you know, w- when you say diversity, it's a scary topic, um, because nobody knows what it means. Does it mean somebody's out? Right. I mean, I remember growing up in in New York in the in the '90s when affirmative action was coming, right? And it just kind of, you know, it set a wildfire of emotions throughout the fire service because it seemed like a lot of folks would not be able to get the job. And um, you know, I know folks that never got on a job because you know they were they were essentially removed from lists. And uh, um, you know, I mean, dozens of lawsuits. I know Chicago's still going through one of their. I think they just settled that one two three years ago. But the after effects are still being felt. And that was in the 90s. So, you know, I think I think that's where these plans need to be a little bit more defined. And and the folks that are going to be involved with it need to, to educate those folks who are going to, you know, uh, be involved with it long term, not short term during the hiring process. But, you know, G's done a lot of good stuff um, with with really looking at it, because, again, it, it's even if it's a nine day a week job for a career firefighter or, you know, I'm sorry, nine day a month job. Or as a volunteer, if it's one or two days, like you, you've, there's got to be some stuff inside of you, you know, that 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 triggers you for success. Um, and then uh, Brendan Trainer, uh, he's an Arizona firefighter. He's a captain out there. I met him last year, uh, two years ago now, and he wrote an article for us last year. Um, and you know, it's interesting. His his company uh, is kind of devising this new hiring process, right? It's not necessarily. Um, you know, you have to be at this city on this date, on this time to take the test. I mean, again, some of it, you know, in order to prevent cheating, like some of that has to happen, but they can start opening the interviews to being over Zoom, right? If, if you're, right, sure. you know, if you're 1,200 miles away and you want to be on that department, um, you know. Um, so Brendan actually, uh, he wrote the article for us. It's kind of like, uh, it was called a new, new generation or new era in firefighter hiring. And I mean, full disclosure, right? Like he's 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 got a company that does this stuff uh, as well. Um, but the the work he's doing is is helping you weed out the folks that aren't going to be successful in job, right? Like you know, they've they've never been involved in their community. They've never done a community service unless they were required to, right? For high school, like, and that's that's a wild thing. Like, oh, hey, um, I did my four community service hours. Hi, right, why don't you come back next weekend? No, I did my four community. But it's 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 again, and, and it's a different time now. There was a lot of stories, you know. I, I read a lot of stuff in 2020 and 21. We had the downtime, right, to read. And you know, they said that was the the that I guess it's the millennial generation is more adept to volunteer and give back in their community, but it's on their terms, you know. But uh I was I was messaging with a with a friend of mine the other day, like her kid gets a cord at uh at graduation for donating blood two times. Right. And, and um, like I, I, one of the things I like to do is I donate platelets, right? Like it was this bizarre thing when my brother was the day after my brother's funeral flying home and red cross calls said, Hey, you're a perfect candidate for platelet donations. It helps cancer patients. I said, I'll be in tomorrow. Right. And that's, that's 
10 years ago and, and with the exception of last year, you know, I do as many donations annually as I can. Uh, I, you know, right now they're giving us socks cause it's winter time, winter time in Texas, but you know, they give you gift cards. They give you, you know, gifts when you come in, like, I don't want it. I'm strict, you know, strictly there because I know people need it. My brother needed this at one point. A lot of my friends have needed this. Like sometimes you just have to do that. Right. And that's, if it's been missed in a generation, right. If there's a generation that doesn't pass along the importance of doing good for your community, um, you know, it's going to get lost and it's, it's not the fault of anybody. It's just not something that was instilled in them. And like, I still do like the, the bike trails and the walking trails here. If I'm in town, it's in April, like the trash bass. Like I love doing that. It gets me out. It gives me a chance to see, you know, you pick where you want to go. Right. And I always go to a different neighborhood or neighborhood I've never been to. Uh, Cause it gives me an opportunity to get out and see the area. Um, but it also gives me a chance to meet people from that area and learn about it. Right. And that's changed my outlook on some of the neighborhoods here in this city and, you know, surrounding cities. So you, you have to be active in your community. You have to be active in other uh, organizations. And I think that's a key to bringing, you know, to bringing people in uh, to an agency nowadays because well, the world's changed. It, it has. Um, one of our regular guests is Chief Jacob Johnson, Assistant mm-hmm. Chief Jacob Johnson in Pearlin. And from the first time I had him on and met him, I was amazed at the success and the growth of this department. And yeah. th- there are people waiting in line to join that department. And it's because they they look at every firefighter as a human being first and a firefighter second. And they just, you know, he said the morale in the years he's been there, and he's been there for quite a while, but, you know, he's just seen morale rise, rise, rise because, better, you know, newer leadership coming in, new people having the interest. They've heard about the department. They heard how active it is and how good it is, you know, family a lot of family programs for, and that's so important. And I think that's something that uh, I know we had in our two departments. One of the key elements was, was, was family and families were always involved um, in, in both departments or always family events uh, that we could have. Uh, and, you know, you invite the whole department basically to your event and whoever could show up could show up. But it was very, very important in both those departments. And I remember the chief sitting down with me when he first talked to me about it, saying, you know, we're not just interested in our firefighters, we're interested in their families, because without their family support, yeah. we don't have good firefighters or people who want to join. And, you know, coming from suburban Boston, I never heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> I, never, I, I never heard anybody, nobody ever asked me about how my family was doing uh, in, in my jobs. They just do your job, clock in, do your job, clock out and go home. And that was it. There was, yeah. there was no interest. But I think I think it's not, this is not just uh, a quirk in the volunteer or part pay department. I think there are lots of uh, of uh, com- uh, city departments, whether it's a small city, a small town, but that do have that. They still want to have family events and they want the families to see what the, the, those members of their department of their family who are in the fire service, what they do and meet some of the people they work with. And I think that goes a long way when you, when a department does that to let those firefighters know that we don't just care about you doing your job in a firehouse. We care about you as a whole person and you have a family that supports you. And, you know, maybe the wives belong in that case, in those days, wives belong to the, the women's auxiliary for the fire department. You know, we had them yeah. in both departments and they were uh, invaluable because long calls, you know, we didn't have an official canteen service, but if we were extended call, the ladies auxiliary came out and they brought hot chocolate, they brought coffee, they brought donuts, they brought cookies, little sandwiches that they they made themselves. They didn't go to a deli, they made tuna sandwiches and cheese sandwiches themselves. Or and, Chick-fil-A. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and to, to have these women who in, that, in these days this is the 70s and up to the mid 80s who some of them were working start working already some you know okay one or two kids already but they would make the effort and say we have to take care of our husband in their department and it just made it so much easier for the, those of us on the calls because and then we had the parties the birthday parties and anniversaries and, and the good things and god forbid there was a 
a sad moment. Everybody came together in that department for that sad moment. Uh, and I think when we treat people like people, as opposed to just a name, a rank, and a duty assignment, I think we're going to do better with our interpersonal relationships and eventually into our hiring processes for new firefighters. It was like, you know, uh, two or three years ago, all on social media was, this generation can't be firefighters. These guys, we don't want them in the fire service. They don't know anything. All they do is play with their video games and their Xboxes and stuff like that. And my retort was, those kids, yeah, in that age. All right, so who do you think's flying our drones today? The kids who are now 22, 23, 24 years old, who have this great eye-hand coordination, are flying our drones around the world to protect this country and other countries. I said, I didn't have any fire firefighting experience. I could check my oil, couldn't change it myself, fill it with gas. I could use hand tools, claws, screwdrivers, hammers, old manual drills. I could do all that, but I had no idea about fire equipment. And I said that to the chief. Yeah. And he said, that's okay. We'll teach you. He says, not everybody's been a firefighter before. He says, but you know, you bring a lot of, of you to the table for me. He says, that's why I want you here because you, you bring a lot more. You're, you have more education than our other formal education than our other firefighters. You've had experience with the Red Cross. He says, because you are, you're coming to us with a list that you should be asking us to do something for you. And instead, you're coming to do what helping what you're wanting to help us. I that's one of the things that was with, with what Dr. Bear said that really rang true with me is that if we we need to look deeper into the people who want to be firefighters. Listen, we all agree yeah. on one thing. It's a calling. Not everybody can do this job. And there are people we don't want to see have to do this job because of what we have to go through and what we see. You know, we we see the crap that we don't want other people to have to see. And we do it. And that does, you know, thankfully now, thank God, with behavioral health initiatives, you know, we don't have to keep it to ourselves anymore. My buddy and I, we talk about yeah. whenever we're together, he's up in Gainesville. And whenever we get together, we always talk about the three or four key calls, the worst calls that we were ever on together. And that's our way of venting. That's how we do it with each other because we were on those calls. We can talk about them today, 40 plus years later and, you know, reevaluate. Did we do everything right? Should we have done this? Should we do that? We're not, we don't beat ourselves up, but it's a way for us to vent because we're all, you know, yes. Do firefighters remember some of their worst calls even after they retire? You don't even have to wait for us to retire because they can happen a week later, a month later, a year later. We can still remember how bad a particular call was. And it takes a toll. And that's why we're blessed now to have a firefighter behavioral initiative. And if you're a regular listener to the podcast, you know that every single podcast, we have a PSA directed just for the fire service about the behavioral health initiative and about the firefighter cancer initiative. Because if we don't work with these initiatives, then we're going to lose the people we have today. And it's going to be very difficult to bring more people in. We know yeah. our susceptibility to cancer is any estimated between 400 and 1,000 percent higher than the average citizen in a community. Uh, that's that's really crappy news. I mean, we love doing our job, but no, you know, we know that there are injuries. We know some of our brothers and sisters pay the ultimate price for being a firefighter. But on the other hand. We want to try to stay as healthy as we possibly can to do the job as long as we want to, as long as we can. Yeah. And I think that looking at the whole person, and I, I really hadn't thought about it in terms of the fire service till I talked with uh, Dr. Bear last week because it made a lot of sense to me in what my hiring programs were in my civilian job um, and what I looked for in my candidates based on the job I was looking to fill. And it was important to me to, to learn about them. Uh, were they married? Were they were they single? Were, did they have a family? Did they have kids? Et cetera. Just so that we know, knew them as a person, not just as an applicant uh, for a job. And that's how we made our, our decisions with the committee. 
So if we can bring that a little bit more humanity to the hiring process and people see that, who have an interest, and who have a, I would venture to say, Peter, you probably know this better than, than me, but I would say the vast majority who want to answer the calling have an idea of what, have an idea of what they're getting into. That's not the bank job, you know, nine to four. That uh, and then you go home and you get to just relax and do nothing else. Um, I think they they come knowing that this is this is going to be a special situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, I good, I, but that's it. I think I think it's that transparency just to ensure because again, I mean, if you're on the job, right? It's like anybody else who's on the job; they know what's going on, right? Um, and uh you just need to ensure that they know what they're walking into. I mean, you can't, you can't explain everything, right. Or, you know, you can't say, Hey, you're going to see death, destruction, mayhem, you know, maimings, fires, trauma to children. Cause people don't understand. There's plenty of people who are very fortunate enough to never experience anything like this. And I think that's, you gotta be as transparent as possible. Um, but how do you, how do you train people or how do you raise awareness to some of that? You know. Right, right. And that, that's why I think that when most of us agree that what we do and what our brothers in blue do and our paramedics and EMTs do is they feel the calling to help other people one way, what, through one of our branches. And to do, when they, if they get that feeling inside them that this is, this is a calling, this is what I want to do, they probably didn't gain that just from reading a book a uh, fiction book about a firefighter or, or a police officer, they, they've had some sort of experience or in their community, they visited the firehouse, talk with firefighters. You know, as I said before, my first exposure was at age seven with a little fire behind our, our in the woods behind our home. And while everybody went to watch them when they pulled the real line to put out the fire, I stayed and the guy was, the engineer was a really nice guy, gave me a lollipop, showed me how he worked the pump and stuff. And I just fell in love with the idea of these men are very special. And I made my parents yeah. drive me to all five stations in our, in our, in our community. And then when I rode my bike, I went further out. And when I had my car, I was right through <laughs> greater Boston to visit. And <laughs> it was wonderful because I got to meet several hundred firefighters um, and every single one of them to, to everyone I met. I can't see the guys who didn't come out and, but everyone I met in those firehouses was was nice to me. And they said, are you going to be a yeah. firefighter? I said, no, no, I have a different plan for my career. What are you going to be? Well, I said, I'd like to be a rabbi. He goes, okay, so where's your interest? I said, well, I've always been involved with first aid and the Red Cross. And he said, well, that's great. And, you know, that's terrific. Who knows? Maybe one day you're going to change your mind. I didn't know that was going to happen because I was only, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. And my yeah. mind was pretty well set. But... Uh, you know, the opportunity happened. To, life took me down that road for that opportunity. And um, I'm forever grateful that it did because we are a family. Um, for the loss we were talking about earlier with my and the friend's family, uh, her um, nephew was a firefighter in uh, Cobb County. For just retired in April for 26 and a half years. And I already heard his name, but I never, he was never in town for me to meet. So we met yeah. this weekend because of the loss. And um, yeah, we're now we're brothers and we're going to be spending time together and stuff like that. And to me, if it was just another, if he wasn't, the guy was an accountant or something like that, it'd be nice to meet him, but wouldn't necessarily be anything beyond that little bit of interaction between the two of us. So I think that bringing humanity to the concept of our retention, because really we need to take care of the people we have who stick with us and do their shifts and cover an extra shift when somebody else needs help. And they're just there for us, men or women. We need to treat them with the respect, they not just as firefighters, but who they are as people giving of their time. Yes, they're being paid for it if it's career, but it's still a very specialized job that we do. 
Yeah. yeah you know, and, and so if we can treat them like that and bring that humanity to both our career departments and our volunteer part pay departments, and even, you know, there's been some you know backlash about WUI firefighters and how they're treated uh, by either the, the the county, their county, or the or the or the, the state or, or the federal government. They're no different than the rest of us as firefighters, career or volunteer. These men and women probably, I mean, you know, look, we climb high ladders, we do high level rescues, but we sure as crap don't jump out of planes to get to a fire call. Most of us, um, but they do. A lot of them do, and that's something. I love the fire service, but I, I'm not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Um, so I, I got to give our brothers and sisters in WUI just as much support and understanding that we give all our other firefighters because it is a hard, dirty, long haul job. And we've been on scenes for you know 24, 48 hours on fires and collapses like that but we don't spend five or six days in the same area just trying to bunk under a fir tree oh yeah yeah yeah. you know so we need to make them understand that we really care about them as people as well and i think if we can and i'm not saying sweeten the pot with money that helps but i think people look to see how they're treated at a job i don't care what the job is how are people treated at that job? And if you get the good scores back, the good reports, then it's a good chance you're going to take the next step. But if all you hear is the BS that's coming, that is, I can't take it anymore. These guys, the chief, we never see him. He's like a ghost. We can't, we can't even make an appointment to see him. It's always got to go to the BC or going to be the deputy, yada, yada. Those departments, I think, are the ones that are losing valuable personnel because yeah. they're being treated just as sticks. You put that stick on this apparatus, you put this stick on that apparatus and send that apparatus out. When they come back, make that stick do this, make that stick do that, give them their dinner, put them to bed till the next call. Yeah, I think that that's old school. That's the way it was. And many of our fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers were firefighters, career and volunteer, because they cared about their com- com- communities. And look, I love seeing the, the old pictures from New York City of the old horse-drawn wagons and the steamers coming out. I mean, that must have been phenomenal in those days. Can we, we can't compare it to today, but I think that was amazing to have seen those firefighters do what they did uh, without the tools that we have today yeah, and yet remain dedicated to that job until they retired or they pass one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And that's what we'd love to see in this department today. People who are really there to do a good job, to serve that community. It may not be their own community. They may live in the town next door or the village next door or the city next door. But if they're interested and they want to protect lives and property, we need to give them, I think it's incumbent upon us, especially today, with all the changes that you've mentioned and I've mentioned, that we treat, look at them as a whole person, not just what, uh, you know, a blank applicant uh, who's going to yeah. take a 25-question exam and sit through an interview with three chiefs, and that's the that's it. That's all we look at. Especially, well, and again. Yeah, good. It's just it, it. Any hiring process has changed, right? Whether it's you know, uh, whether it's uh, applying for, you know, something even as McDonald's, right? I mean, and and that's interesting. That that story came up the other day, uh, uh, in a local forum, right? Is the it was an interesting question because they said, why are there no children working at McDonald's anymore? And, um. Is it a forms board or threads or something like that? I forget where I saw it. But they're like, well, if you only wanted kids to work at McDonald's, who's going to be there from six in the morning till four in the afternoon? So, you know, there needs to be adults there. It tends to be an older population. And they're like, well, that's that's a job for somebody 23 and under. And it's funny because they went back and forth. 
And and then somebody chimed in and says, have you seen the hiring process to work at McDonald's now? It's not like it used to be. It's very tedious. It's very tough to get that job. And, it, you know, I, I've never applied. I don't know about that place. Um, but, you know, it, it really makes you wonder, like, again, like, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what the problem. Maybe it's just maybe that person had difficulty filling out the application. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but every hiring process is different. You know, whether you're filling out an online form right now, um, you might not get a test because of the stuff you post on social media, right? I mean, that's part of your background check. That's and right. that's, you know, I mean, it's 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 the things that we take advantage uh, of until we end up realizing that, you know, there could be a negative impact. And, you know, I, I, I think probably twice, three times a month uh, when I see a memory on Facebook, man, I go and delete that thing right away. I'm like, I can't believe I said that. Nothing bad. It's just, it's stupid. And I, I 10 years from now, I don't want to look back on that memory and go, I said that, like, what a, you know, what a foolish thing to say. Again, it's not something that would get me in trouble, but it was just like, it was an inside joke, you know? And like, again, 10 years ago, Facebook was an opportunity for you to do that, right? When you only saw your friends posts, right? You didn't see right. all this other stuff that pops up. Um, you know, now I could throw an inside joke out there and nobody will ever see it because the algorithms, the way they go. So again, like even that's, that's changed, but yeah, I mean that the application processes have changed. Um, the 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 jobs, no matter what it is, the jobs have changed. And I mean, look how many folks you know came into the fire service to get a pension uh, on the career side, and you know they're lucky if they get a four hundred one k at this point. Um, and you know on the volunteer side, you know I know some areas they offer the low sap that like the service rewards program. Um, you know, some just offer five dollars for a call, eight dollars for training, that type of thing. And then there's plenty of people who are out there, you know, not ever making a dollar off it, and they're fine with it. Um, but again, just looking, you know, you, you got to look at that. What's what is the reward? Is it the money? Is it the sense of feel good? Is it the camaraderie? Is it, you know, um, they're looking for a place? I mean, you know, I, when you're when you're a kid, just you know like you were saying before right when you're a kid and you're you're looking for someplace right if you're from a uh, a single parent home and you're looking for a little you know decision help making decisions a little guidance like swing by the firehouse and you can usually find somebody right like that's the unofficial big brother big sister organization exactly. of the US and um that's not necessarily a role that people choose to take on when they become a firefighter but Again, that level of trust is up there, and that kind of turns that into that. So um, that's you know, that's a person you need to find. We saw that very clearly depicted in L.A. County Fire Fire and Rescue over the summer, where the um, guys from the department in uh, the station in um, uh, south part of the city, I forget what's called that neighborhood, um, but they mentor kids. Who come by the, the kids come by with their homework and they were mentoring them and they were helping them with math or they're helping them with science and to see them sitting down these guys with you know 15 20 years in and a kid comes up on his bike with a school book with them and they're going to sit down to practice reading or help them with math stuff like that that's and and then two seconds later the bells ring and they're going on a shooting uh two blocks from the firehouse but seeing them and again this is why you know i changed my opinion of dick wolf's production uh, he had another fire show that uh, i don't watch because of the way it, it's it depicts the fire service but to see what he did with this these episodes and seeing and, and by the way i i checked I, I, I looked at it right away and asked a couple of friends about if they thought this was canned for the show. And he said, no, I have a friend out in LA. And he said, no, this is who some of these guys are. And this is what they do. When training is done and there's some free time, they open those doors and they the kids come by after school and they'll ask for help on math. Or they've asked, they've told them, all right, come back to me after you get that worksheet and I'll work with you tomorrow on it. And I think that was one of the greatest representations of who we are as as firefighters being part of a community there there is yeah you can we can collect for charities we do our holiday celebrations but 
when you are willing to sit down with kids, oftentimes from broken homes, uh, bad circumstances, who are trying to get their way through school, but their heads aren't on straight because of what's going on in their lives, they can come to the firehouse and they know that there are people there who care about them, who will help them with homework, give them good advice, how to not to join the gangs, how to be good. You can you can succeed and things like that is so important. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, I think that would be a great article for the magazine. Find these guys at, in LA County who, who were doing this. And I'm sure it's not just LA County. I mean, Oh no, uh, no. But they were the, only, they were the first ones to truly be depicted. It just into working with a community, not just answering calls. And yeah, again, I think I was so moved by seeing that being a teacher for well over 50 years. Uh, and I teach at every opportunity I can. I think that showing that on national TV was one of the best of any real or fictional fire show that's ever been on since Rescue 8. Yeah, that's how old I am. I remember Rescue 8. But I've watched them all. And reality, et cetera. But this was a great representation. And if this is something you listening to, and you are a firefighter, career or volunteer, WI. You have the opportunity of bringing humanity to, to your department and reaching out to the community, not just for smoke detectors and batteries, but, you know, what these, our brothers did in, in LA County, making the time to sit with a kid outside the, outside the bay doors, helping them with spelling, helping them with math, a third grader, a fifth grader, a seventh grader. You you can't even imagine how far that interpersonal experience could go for that child. And yeah. you could change what might be a negative because of the community that surrounds them. You might change that into the positive. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the McDonald's thing. When I was the uh, administrator and triage director for a large family practice here in, in Broward, um, I needed to hire somebody new for the office. So I put an ad in the paper. You had to be computer literate. You had to know how to use Word. You had to use um, Access. Uh, you use Excel. So I put all that in the paper. And we got some calls here and there. And uh, I got a call. And my receptionist answered, and she told me, you know, line three, pick it up in the back. Picked it up. And it was a gentleman who was asking for the job. I want to apply for the job. And I said, do you have computer experience? I said, he said, yes. I said, okay, do you know DOS? Do you know Windows? Where are you? He goes, well, I run the computer on the frying machine at McDonald's. I said, what? Excuse me? You mean the cash register? He goes, no, no, there's a computer built in to the fryer. So I have to hit the switch to turn it on and make activate the timer and then i have to shut it off when the timer gets off so that's all computer run i said okay thank you very much for the call i'll keep it under advisement now you know again in a, in a community we we don't know how people interpret the words of course that was in the days when we were all still reading newspapers um which we don't do that much more. Everybody runs to Indeed or Monster Monster dot com, something like that. But there, I could have been very crude and rude to the to the gentleman. But I explained to him that really was not what we were looking for because we're not food oriented. We are a medical office, and I said, "Have you worked on a desktop computer?" I had asked him, and he says, "No, the only computer I work with is at work." I said, "Okay, thank you very much." I said, um, "I have your name and number here on my list." I appreciate the call. So I couldn't hire hire him. But I would have been wrong as the administrator to just to blow him off rudely on the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, while we found the story cute, it really tells the story of how do you treat somebody when they're apply, come, applying for a job at your business or your organization? Yeah. You, can, you can blow them off, and you could probably turn them off forever by doing it or you can get a little bit of information see if 
there might be a way to make a fit. They're not, it's not always going to happen, but you got to give it to weigh, weigh the pros and cons and then go from there. And that's part of, I think, looking at the person and not just, you know, the paper. And maybe yeah. with that, if we can convince departments to, to look a little deeper into the people, uh, maybe we can, you know, increase our numbers a little easier than we are having for the last couple of years. And I think, it, you know, COVID was the big change, but the societal change from, you know, I, I left, uh, I was out, uh, I finished in 85 when I got disabled yeah. out. So, uh, but even then, the department I was with didn't have a problem with volunteers in upstate New York. But now, you know, they're mostly a career department with only a few volunteers. And that's changed because of society's changes. That's what it yeah. is. You know, we, uh, money's tight. Uh, things are more expensive, way more expensive today. And people need to do what they can to uh, put food on the table, keep the lights on and the, and the heat or, or air conditioning on going too. So people are looking for work. As we said earlier, not everyone's cut out to be a firefighter or a paramedic or a police officer. But it might do us all a little bit better to look at the whole person and change our definition of recruitment and re retention and recruitment, sorry, Chief, uh, rec retention and recruitment and see maybe be able to grow our enrollment uh, by some decent numbers by just being more human in our uh, search and hiring processes. Yeah. I, I think you're right, right? It's, it's like anything else, right? You, it, it's, it's, the workplace has changed. Uh, and on the career side, I mean, I, there's, there's certainly a difference in, in, in the types of folks you're looking for. But on the volunteer side, like it goes back to what I said earlier, right? If you've got that accountant and that's, you know, they're, they're 52 and they have no interest in going to fires, let them be a member. You know, you don't have to buy them gear. It's not, it's not like you have to buy gear for everybody who walks through the door, you know, and that's, it, maybe that's the reason why, you know, departments are a mix of, you know, career, you know, whether it's civil service or civilian, right? Because it's, it's, they're still a member of the department. It's just in a different capacity. Uh, now, of course, rank and file, it's a, it's a different story, but, you know, uh, I mean, you've got some of these diverse communities and like, you, I, you know, you mentioned Adam Teal's coming on, Commissioner Teal and, like what they're doing in in that city, uh, I was with him at a event a few weeks ago, and like they're doing so many unbelievably phenomenal things. Um, but you know they've got one of the most diverse populations as a city. As a city, um, and there's even a few of those here in the DFW Metroplex. Like there's one zip code at one point the chief had written they had like 26 languages were spoken in one zip code here. And I mean, like how do you how do you how do you have the ability to communicate? I mean, listen, for an emergency, I'm sure you can find an app if you if you know the language that the person is is speaking, right? But if you need to go out and do community risk reduction, fire prevention messaging, you know, is it your job? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, when you have one person <laughs> assigned to 45 schools and, you know, uh, there's only 52 weeks a year and, and they have to do senior facilities and they have to do businesses and, and Main Street festivals and all this other stuff, um, you, you know, you, you can't, and you do the best you can. Uh, and that's, again, that's more acceptable in that place. On the fire side, you know, the fire suppression side, it's different. But, you know, you have to have some of that diversity to be able to work in your community and, and understand because people do ask. And, you know, it's, uh, I want to be, I want to speak to somebody or I want somebody who can, you know, speak my language or understand my my cultures and my beliefs. And, and it's tough, but that's, that's something that is required nowadays. Most people expect that. Right. So you have to make that right. happen. So, well, you know, we, one of the things that is you and I know the favorite axioms in the fire service is we don't like change and we don't like status quo. Amen. Amen. Right. <laughs> to both of us. Yeah. Right. So, uh, we, we need to change that a little bit and, uh, open ourselves up. And I think that, um, I believe that we can make inroads with our, our recruitment 
uh, our retention, keeping the people we have, make sure, look, not everybody's going to be happy-go-lucky, uh, but we can keep them mostly feeling, feeling good about the job, feeling good about themselves, uh, feeling good about their fire family, and know that they're able to spend the time with their own family as they need, getting a, a fair, getting a fair uh, salary if it's a career department. Um, being a, you know being a member of the IAFF is is a is a positive uh, experience as well. So that helps you as well. And I just think we just need to do what we can in today's world because we're not in my day of seventy seven. We're not in my day of eighty five. Here we are in the third uh, decade of of the twenty first century, and we can't operate the same way we did twenty years ago. Life is different. People are different. Uh, what we do is different. You know, my day we had real wood that burned. There was no, you know, benzene byproducts, uh, you know, around in those days. We had a longer incipient stage. Today, that's all changed. Most furniture is manufactured. Most filling is foam from butane and benzene byproducts. So those incipient stages have shrunk dramatically. We don't have as much time to get to a fire call as we did. Traffic is worse. Those, my days, people listen pretty well to sirens when we came through. Today, they can barely hear them, let alone move over for them. Yeah. We know the epidemic of, uh, of uh, accidents at accident scenes with distracted driving, which trying slowly but surely to make inroads with that. But we're in a different, we're, we're living a different life than the old fire service. This is not, yeah. you know, ha- having two grown daughters, you know, I can actually say this is not their father's fire service anymore uh, because it's not. Um, I just tried to learn what I can of today's fire service and share and bring people on like Peter and the P- our guests to share what today's fire service is is facing and doing, uh, not just reminiscing about the old days. So, Peter, again, I can't thank you enough for taking time from a very busy schedule. I know you're here or there. I will say that I love watching uh, the, the uh, TV show, even though I watch repeats and I continue to watch them, of the Texas Game Wardens. And I get to see those small communities. But that's what I really love. Look, watching the ones from New Hampshire, Maine, and Texas, I really love to see those small communities, how tight they are, Jasper County, uh, some of the others that I, I get to see a lot, and just how damn polite those wardens are uh, and how the rapport they have within their their communities. That is what amazes me more, yeah. that, that people... For the most part, they'd like to see them pull up. They like to see them, and I know there are a couple of them that say, when they're finished with a call and they're leaving, they say, "Hey, you need anything? Just give me a ring." And most of them have their direct phone numbers, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I never saw that in the Boston area. I've never seen that in the Syracuse area or Greensboro area. But to watch it there and to see a state as large as Texas, but have as many small communities and wonderful people working to protect the wildlife there and so dedicated to it and the people is just enlightening. And um, I, I, I'm glad that I, I did make it down to, to Dallas on a, um, on a travel program that I was, when I was an agent and got to see the greater Fort Worth Dallas area. And I it was nothing like I expected. It was wonderful, but again, it was a big city Two big cities, but a wonderful country just outside of them to enjoy. So I, I think it's a it's a great state. Never, even though I haven't lived there, I think the people there just seem wonderful. And so I admire that you're you're down there and uh, as busy as you are. Yeah, Southern hospitality, you know, it, it, it changes you. Uh, you know, <laughs> having gone from New York to Minnesota was was a complete – I talk about, you know – culture change tremendous culture change and then coming you know and and uh it, it's just that the people in in minnesota tend to be a little bit more reserved you come down here and it's 
you know, it's hello, goodbye, have a good day. You know, everyone's gracious and, and, um, uh, it's cool. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's a nice place to live, but you know, you can tell, you can tell who's a, who's a transplant and who's a local, not just by the accent. Cause I mean, the, the Texas accents, you know, it's rare that you find people with that, but you could tell again, it's, it's the way you were raised. Right. And, and, exactly. and, and the respect that you, you know, continue to have for other people. It's, it's apparent in about six seconds of interaction. Yeah. We found uh, the same thing. We moved to Greensboro. People were, they held the door open for you. They yeah. said, Hey, stranger, you walk past them in the doorway at the market. Hi, how you doing? Why? Yeah. Well, I grew up outside of Boston. Nobody, nobody said that, but yeah, it's that that southern hospitality really is different than yeah the north northeast areas. Yeah. Agree, agree. Yeah, it's a good thing. It's right. a good thing, Steve. All right. Well, many thanks again, uh, folks. If you're watching the video, uh, this will be the end of the video. If you're listening to the audio, you know we're going to have a little break here, and then we'll be back with some more items coming up. But our sincere thanks to Peter Matthews, the editor in chief of uh, Firehouse Magazine, for joining us as we talked about. No, well, we talked about about being nice in the fire service and how important even what it is in relationship when or with our people in our community being nice to them they'll they'll be nice to us and covering what the the critical issues that are facing us today in personnel for both our career and volunteer departments so again thank you for watching this episode we'll be back next week with commissioner Adam Thiel from Philadelphia Fire Department. As always, please keep tuned. Subscribe to our videos on our YouTube channel, 5-Alarm Task Force Corp. And take care of yourselves. Take care of those around you. Let's make sure everyone goes home. Thank you, folks. Bye-bye.